So have you ever met a vegetarian, and before you answer, ever met a vegetarian who's not really a vegetarian? Anybody met one of those? Ah, a few of you. Um, this is a vegetarian who says something like this. I'm a vegetarian, but I really like bacon, right? Or, you know, but today, and so on, you know. I, and what they're saying is, you know, I have a conscience about these things. I don't like eating meat, well, except for, you know, the occasional steak or whatever it is, right? Um, and, of course, that's kind of fun, but um, real vegetarians, they don't like this very much, you know, and they don't appreciate that... Uh, some people would call themselves such a thing without it being real and true. And so actually, real vegetarians have kind of said, hey, you need a new name for yourself if, if you're not going to be full on the real thing, if you're just going to be a pseudo vegetarian. And in fact, uh, over time, a new name has developed. This is a real thing. They're, the people who are vegetarians but not really vegetarians, they are called flexitarians. For real, <laughs> flexitarians. Uh, and there's something about our human nature that we like to be a part of things. We like to, to say, wow, that's cool, I'll, I'll do that. Or we give lip service to things. We join a cause, join a club, put a sticker on ourselves and say, I'm one of those. And we like doing that until it costs us something, right? Until uh, there, there's, there's some area of thing we have to give up or something we have to do different that we weren't planning on doing. And at that point, we have a challenge because we don't really like to admit to ourselves or to others that we weren't willing to pay the price. And so we, we, we play these games. We do these compromises. We try to get the benefits without paying the price. We have a kind of selective commitment. Well, the same thing happens for sure, maybe in even greater ways, when it comes to our faith, when it comes to Christianity. It's very common to have what we might call a customized Christianity, right? Sort of, I will follow Jesus, but I'd like to pick and choose how. Uh, I'll follow Jesus, but hey, Jesus, don't ask me to let go of some of that bitterness I'm carrying around. I'll follow you, Jesus, but don't touch my money. I'll follow you, Jesus, but don't make me love that person, right? Right? Uh, don't make me treat that person that way. I'll follow you, Jesus, but let me date whoever I want, or don't tell me how to behave in my sex life, or in, in the way I speak, or what I can and cannot watch on TV. I want Jesus. I just don't want him to disrupt my life, right? I don't want him to be invasive. I, I, I want to live my own life, my own status quo. Kyle Eidelman says it this way. He says, most of us don't mind Jesus making some minor changes in our lives, but Jesus wants to turn our lives upside down. Upside down. We don't mind him doing a little touch-up work, but Jesus wants a complete renovation. And man, that's hard when we're embracing a flexitarian kind of Christianity. Uh, Christianity that says, I'll take Jesus, but not anything that makes me uncomfortable. And so we're in a series. We're calling it, I Love My Church. We're talking about the, the beauty and the wonder of God's church when the church is working right and when a group of people love what God has called them to and what God has called them to be a part of. And we've been sharing with uh, our, our congregation some of the core values around here, who we're called to be. Um, we've talked about being a team. We do church as a team. Uh, we've talked about our, our uh, value called Simply Jesus, that we're a Christ-centered community. We've talked about no perfect people, that we're a grace-filled place where none of us are perfect and the, the, uh, the value of humility and so on. Um, and now, we're, today, we're going to talk about the value we call all in, all in. And being all in is a big value around here. It's a big value because one of the greatest enemies, one of the greatest enemies of God's church and one of the greatest enemies of real Christianity is mediocrity. Mediocrity, a kind of faking it, a kind of pseudo-Christianity where we're, we're sort of in, but we're not really in. And church, there is a shallow, decaffeinated, watered-down version of Christianity that is very popular, and it affects all of us at one level or another. But the challenge is that, that while it's safe, it ends up being kind of boring to be a part of. While it's comfortable, it ends up leaving us stagnant. While we believe in eternal life, we never really live fully alive when we're in that. And in the book of Revelation, the first few chapters, there's this part where Jesus writes letters to the churches. We call them the seven letters to the churches. It's a fascinating part of Scripture. In fact, uh, it's really good for the church to read because here we are, the church, and Jesus has written us letters. We did a series on it a number of years ago. We called it We've Got Mail. We got mail, church. One of the churches that Jesus writes to is Laodicea. And this is what he says in his, his warning or his conviction to, to Laodicea. He says this. He says, I know the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold. 
I wish you were one or the other. We should just go one way or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Wow, those are strong words. God says halfway, half-heartedness, that is, is distasteful to God. And he relates it. One translation says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. That actually means to throw up. That's pretty strong uh, language. And you ever put something in your mouth that you instantly wanted to let go of and <laughs> quickly, right? This is what God says this makes him feel like. Uh, sometimes I've renamed this just for our sake to, to maybe remember it a little more. I call this puke warm Christianity. <laughs> yeah, how's that for a word picture for you? Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Jesus actually goes on in this passage to say, listen up, Laodicean church. You think you've got it all together. You're comfortable. You, f- you, you look right on the outside, but inside there's an emptiness. Underneath all of that, if we could get past the pretense, it's not real. And I love that Jesus uses the word lukewarm because lukewarm isn't something you have to make any effort to get, right? Lukewarm is something that happens all by itself. Uh, there, you, you just leave something and it'll inevitably become just influenced by what's around it. It becomes lukewarm. There's an inevitable pull, an inevitable pull towards mediocrity. And, and there's various reasons for that. And again, all of us will battle this. All of us will struggle with this. It's inevitable in all of our lives. And uh, part of the reason is just the price, the price that, that we pay to, to follow Jesus. Um, it's true in, in every area of our lives, certainly in following Christ, that uh, we, we, we all naturally want to get as much as we can for as little as possible right? The most for the least, right? We want to gain as much. We, we, we'd like the benefits of being close to Jesus without the cost. And that's one of the reasons. You know, another reason is just that we live in a world that is cold towards God. That's the world we live in. And inevitably, as we're around that world and as that world influences us, if you splash cold water into hot water, what happens? Eventually, it cools it off cools it off. And, and, and certainly, when we compromise here and compromise there and compromise there, we can start to think, well, you know, it's not that bad, it's not that bad, and, and pretty soon it, it cools off what was meant to be all in, right? What was meant to be hot, and uh, that's part of the reason. And there's another reason, it's one that's convicting to me, and it's what I call familiarity. Familiarity, and that can happen to us, especially for those of us who maybe grew up in church, or I grew up in a, in a great church and in a godly home, or I learned these things regularly. But one of the challenges when you hear something over and over again is sometimes things that are absolutely wonderful and amazing cease to be wonderful and amazing just because of the familiarity we have with them. And so sometimes we hear about the, 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 the fact that Jesus died on a cross for you, for me. But we hear it so often, we become so familiar with it, it doesn't have that same impact it ought to have on our hearts. Or sometimes we hear about the greatness of God, just the awesomeness of who He is, but because we've heard it so many times, it loses that, again, that, 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 uh, the punch that it ought to have. Or we hear about amazing grace, but it ceases to be amazing to us. Now, Jesus knew that we'd battle these things. In fact, Jesus addressed this full on again and again in his teachings. He never hid from it. He never uh, uh, pretended that this wasn't uh, a, a regular challenge for anybody who wanted to follow him. Jesus was, was very much willing to go there. You ever had a conversation with somebody and they started going somewhere kind of awkward and you're like, you're not going there, are you? That's what Jesus, Jesus was always willing to go there, to make people uncomfortable. Um, he never, he never uh, would, would get people to sign on to following him And then just kind of snatch the paper away before they could read the fine print and say, gotcha, you know, tricked ya. Jesus made sure that fine print was bold, loud, and clear. In fact, the first sermon I ever preached, I was a first-year Bible college student, and our church uh, was having a a Bible college Sunday. Uh, Pastor George and Hazel, they're going to be here next week. And uh, I don't know why they let me, but they let me uh, uh, preach a little 15-minute sermon in that uh, church. And, and what I did for that sermon is I just uh, took the congregation to the book of Luke. We opened it up and we read each of the calls of Jesus. I called the sermon the call of Christ. And we just read each time Jesus called people. But what, what we noted was how radical the call was. He didn't leave the, 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 the commitment side. He didn't leave the cost side out and just say, oh, just follow me. It'll all be fun and games. It'll all be easy. He 
put it in bold, bold ink. And part of the reason I shared that as the first sermon I ever preached was because for me, a passage in Luke chapter 9 became kind of like a, a theme verse for my life in the summer of 1990. And through that whole summer, this verse rocked my world. It rocked my world. Uh, and I just want to show it to you here today. If you have a Bible, you can turn there, Luke chapter 9. Um, we'll put it up on the screen, but sometimes it's good to see it in your Bible too or, or on your own device, your own phone and such. And here's what it says, uh, Luke chapter 9. Here we go. Verse 23, then Jesus said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Now, we should just pause there for a second, because when we hear this today, I don't know if we hear how radical it was to the people Jesus was speaking to. You see, Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. Uh, at this point in history, the cross was not a symbol of Christianity. It's not what we think of it as, something you'd put on a building or put around a necklace or put in a pretty spot somewhere. Uh, at this time in history, the cross was a means of brutal, bloody torture and then death. That's what it was, torturous death. And so Jesus says here, he says, hey, everybody, if you want to follow me, give up your selfish ways, die a torturous death every single day and follow me. You imagine how just how radical that would ring in people's ears? A shameful, torturous death every day, every day. Of course, he goes on to say, if you hang on to your life, this is verse 24, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. This happens every time Jesus makes a radical call like this. He goes, yes, it's radical. Yes, the price is high. But then he always reminds them, and the benefit is well worth it. It's going to cost you everything, but the, the benefits are going to be multiplied back to you. You're going to be so glad you did. Verse 26, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and the glory of the Father and his holy angels. Okay, Jesus, you said it clear. Help us get it, right? Uh, one person said it this way. He said, you know, some of us, struggle with this, the being sort of uh, comfortable Christianity. And he says, maybe uh, better than the cross for some of us, instead of the cross being the symbol of our faith, we, we might be better with what he calls a snuggy theology. Snuggy theology. You guys know what a snuggy is? A snuggy, they advertise them on TV. It's a blanket with holes in it for your arm. And they're just, you know, you just have your snuggy, just keeps you warm, Right? And for some, time, some of us, sometimes, that better represents our faith than the cross. So, so how do you recognize that when it's creeping into your own life? How do you recognize it uh, when, when we try to choose Christianity without the cross or, or comfort over character, convenience over the real thing? Well, uh, a few things that I think will help you see it in your own life. Um, the first is that you'll find it immensely boring. <laughs> it's boring. Christianity was meant to be the greatest adventure you could know in your life. It's a high-stake deal. It's supposed to get your heart racing following Jesus. In fact, if you ever watch a movie, an adventure movie, you'll notice this about every adventure movie. There's always high stakes. High stakes. There's risks involved. There's tension. There's a cost. That's what makes it an adventure. That's what creates the tension in it. And the same is true with the Christian faith. In fact, if people come to me and say, you know, I'm following Jesus, but it's just so boring for me, one of the questions I ask them is, are you sure you've tried the real thing? Are you sure you've been engaged in the real thing? The, the second thing that we can notice when this starts creeping into our lives is that it just starts to feel inauthentic. We can turn it on and turn it off when we feel like it, when it's convenient for us. And the last thing, the sad thing is that really this version of Christianity is a, such a, a Christianity light. It's a watered down version that really has no power to it. You see, the Christian faith was meant to be something that was life-changing that was filled daily with God at work in our daily lives. But what happens is if we embrace a kind of lukewarm, a kind of convenience Christianity, what happens is it loses that powerful edge. It just becomes a form. What, what Paul warned Timothy about, he says, sometimes we can embrace a form of godliness, but deny its power. Deny its power. And it doesn't really change us. It doesn't really have the power to set us free from sin or impact other people's lives through us. 
So we know this. We know that our hearts will never really be alive when we're in that kind of place. And we all find ourselves going there at times. But here's something else that I want you to, to notice and feel if you find your faith going in that direction. If you'll listen on the inside, you will sense the Holy Spirit trying to stir something in you. You'll, you'll feel the, 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 the Spirit of God just going, this is not what it was meant to be like. There's more than this. In fact, sometimes we sing it that way. There's a line in a song. There's got to be more than this. There's more than this. I, I, I feel dissatisfied with the status quo, with a safe, powerless, decaffeinated Christianity. I, I know there's more. And if you'll allow the Spirit of God to stir that in you, and God stirs that regularly in His church and in His people, if you'll allow Him to take His words like the ones we're looking at with Jesus and to just make you go, no, 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 I'm not satisfied with that version of Christianity, you'll find yourself being called to a higher place. Uh, one more passage that I want you to see with Jesus speaking. This is in Luke 14. It, there's a lar large crowd following Jesus, and He actually did this a few times. When, when the crowd got real big, People got real excited about the miracles he was doing, the cool stuff he was doing. Sometimes he would look back at them and go, okay, okay, guys, settle down a bit. Let me just tell you about the price side. In fact, one time he just said, the reason you're following me is so you can see cool miracles, right? So you can get a few more loaves and fishes. And then he goes right after their hearts and goes, here's what you need to know. So this is what happens in this particular passage. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around to them and said, if you want to be my disciple... You must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own, here it is again, cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Again, these are strong words. And Jesus intentionally makes them strong. Of course, he's not saying you're actually supposed to hate anybody else. You with me on that? What he's saying is, he demands a kind of exclusivity from our hearts. Um, just like a husband or wife would. And we know this in life. It would be inappropriate for a husband or a wife to go to their spouse and say, hey, I love you, I'd like to have you in my life, but I'd like a few boyfriends on the side. I'd like a few girlfriends on the side, right? I and mean, we don't go, no way, no way. And just like your husband or your wife would demand exclusivity, God does the same thing. And by the way, by the way, I don't just make up that illustration out of the air. That's an illustration God uses several times with his people in Scripture. In the same passage here with Jesus in Luke 14, he goes on to say, so, so count the cost. Count the cost. If you're going to build a building, you don't build it and then get 20% through and go, whoops. Didn't, didn't know how much that would cost and just leave a 20% built building. If you're going to go off to war, he says, as if you're a king going off to war, you, you figure out how many troops you need before you send them off to war. Or else people will say, man, that was foolish. And Jesus says, so it's the same with following me. Count the cost. And he actually ends the passage with this verse. You cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. What a verse. What a verse. Why don't we just read that out loud together? Could we do that? So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Do we really believe that? One time Jesus was asked the most important commandment, and his answer back was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Notice the repeated word there, all, all in. The way we like to say it around our church is 95% commitment to God is 5% short. 95% <laughs> commitment to God is 5% short. Now, you say, well, come on, pastor. I mean, you're asking for a lot. Jesus is asking for a lot. If really, if I have to give up everything, I know my own heart. I know my own capacities. I, I've tried to be more committed, and I just can't. I'll fail. I'll fall. I won't make it. <laughs> Absolutely true. But, but just because we don't reach the bar, just because we don't make it to the standard that God sets for us, to the, what he calls us to, it doesn't mean we have the right to just lower the bar so we can feel better about ourselves. Isn't that right? What it does mean is that we call ourselves and we let God's word call us to increasing commitment to him every day of our lives. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. No one ever has loved God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength but Jesus. You with me? No one's ever done that this side of heaven. None of us will accomplish that. 
But we are committed to making that increasingly true in our lives and making forward motion in that in our lives. And when we fall and fail, which we will, we're committed to getting back up and continuing to move in that direction. So what does it look like? What does it look like for a Christian or for a church to make this a value in our lives? I want to give you four things um, so we can kind of see what it would look like. The first is, I will bear his name. I will bear his name. I'll take a stand for him. I'll have a kind of unashamed witness for him. We read it already in Luke 9. Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes. What Jesus is saying here is he's saying, look, who I am and what my message is will be radically countercultural. And there will be times in your life when, when who I am and what my message is goes so against the grain of culture that you'll be tempted to just hide it. You'll be tempted to just pretend it's not there. You'll be tempted to take the sticker off and say, not me. And Jesus says, when that happens, don't do it. When that happens, hold my name high. Be willing to take risks. Be willing to, 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 to uh, allow yourself to maybe be shunned or shamed for the sake of Christ. And that means for us as a church, we take the risks to invite our friends, to pray for them, to share Jesus with them. It means that no matter how unpopular it is uh, in this world to be followers of Jesus, we won't bow to the pressure. We will be proud of our Savior. You know what else it means for our church? It means that where Jesus' words are controversial in our world, where Jesus' words go against the grain of culture, we have a commitment that we will not water down God's word just to make our culture feel better. Somebody want to say amen right there? Yeah, that's a commitment we have. We won't do it. We won't water it down no matter how tough it gets, no matter how scary it is, no matter how much our culture doesn't like it. God's word is God's word. And we'll hold it to what it says and we'll proclaim it for what it says. Now, I need to make a caveat on the other side of this because some Christians have used uh, principles like this to be kind of rude and belligerent to the world. And sometimes, in the name of Jesus, Christians have taken passages of Scripture that are against the values of this world and kind of shouted them at the world and then said, who cares what you think? <laughs> right? How many of you know we care what they think? That is so against the spirit of Christ to, to shout things at the world and then, and then turn our backs on them and say, we don't care what you think, or we're just telling you the truth, like it or leave it. That's not the spirit of Jesus. That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is that we would do everything possible to win this world for Christ. That's why the church is meant to be a winsome place. Jesus one time, or sorry, uh, the, the, the scriptures one time where it's, it's calling us to be a witness. It says, be ready to give an answer to, to people who ask you about your faith. But then it says this, do this with gentleness and respect. Do this with gentleness and respect. When we proclaim the word of God, is it offensive to the world? Absolutely. There's lots of things in the gospel that are offensive to the world. But we do our utmost to share those offensive things in a gentle way, in a respectful way, in a winsome way. And, and we will never, ever, ever offend people unnecessarily or purposefully. Does that make sense? That's our heart. Our heart is to win people, not offend them. So we should never make it hard or try to put up barriers. We'll let the gospel stand for what it is, and where it's offensive, we'll let it say what it says. But we're not going to purposely, you know, try to bash people over the head with it. Fair? Are we good on that? Okay. So that's the first thing that all in looks like. I bear his name with unashamed witness. The second thing that all in looks like is I obey his word. There's an uncompromising obedience. Uh, Jesus talked about this over and over again. John 14. He just says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Another time he, he looks at a group of people and he says, why are you calling me Lord if you're not doing what I say? There's a contradiction there. In fact, one time people come to him and they say this. They say, Lord, I'd like to follow you, but let me first go do this and this and this. Do you hear the contradiction in that statement? Lord, me first. Right? Lord, me first. And Jesus just looks at him and says, that's not going to work, guys. Don't, don't do the Lord and then do the me first. Instead, if, if Jesus says something, our job is to say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whatever your word says, 
I'll obey it. And sometimes it'll go against the grain. Sometimes it'll teach me new behaviors and areas of my life. But if God's word says that I should speak a certain way, then I say, yes, sir. If God's word says my sexuality should be in a certain way and within certain boundaries, I say, yes, sir. If God says my finances or my relationships or my heart or my forgiveness or my time or my focus or whatever area of my life it is, when he says it, I see it, my job is to say, yes, sir, not to say, ooh, I'll compromise here or there in it. And the challenge for all of us is that we all have areas of our lives, areas of our hearts, where we have a kind of sign set up for Jesus that says, keep out, right? Restricted area, right? And the challenge of Scripture, the challenge of the Lordship of Christ is to hand Jesus an all-access pass and to just say, God, every area, every area of my life is yours. So that leads us to the third one, and that is I will serve him sacrificially. Following Jesus means unselfish service, just like he offered to us on the cross, 2 Corinthians 5.15. And this is really the essence of this whole message today. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ. He laid down his life for us, and he invites us to lay down our lives for him and for others. And that's what following Jesus actually looks like. And I'll tell you, that's a tough thing. It means sacrifice. But there's something engaging and exhilarating about that. The way uh, we've said it before is if you haven't found something worth dying for, you haven't found something worth living for. You were made for the intensity of living for something bigger than yourself. And Christianity is meant to be that, a a consuming passion, an an all-out pursuit, a radical adventure. And while I'm meddling, and I am meddling, okay, let me just mention money here one more time. Because I think there is, is in Scripture a real emphasis on this. That if our hearts are really converted to God, it will show up in our finances. It will. Jesus was abundantly clear on that. That there's a direct line between our heart and our wallet. And it's, it's a question worth just wrestling with. One preacher said it this way. He says, sometimes when people get baptized, they're holding their wallet out. You know, and just going under, but keeping their wallet out of the water. Church, uh, you can see it in your finances, where your heart is, and uh, God will keep, keep uh, chasing us down for our whole hearts. So here's the last one. I will bear his name, that's unashamed witness. I will obey his word, that's uncompromising obedience. I will serve him sacrificially, that's unselfish service, laying down my life. And then finally, I will seek him wholeheartedly, that's unrestrained pursuit. It's a pursuit of Jesus. It's a pursuit of getting to know God more, follow him more wholeheartedly with our whole lives. A.W. Tozer said, it's not that we don't want Jesus. It's just that we want other things more. And then he said this, you have as much of God as you actually want. Are you actually pursuing him? In Jeremiah 29, 13, God said, if you'll seek me with all your heart, or if you'll look for me wholeheartedly, then you'll find me. It's there that you'll find me. Him. And, you know, God made us with the ability to kind of get passionate about things, obsessed with things, if you will. We can get really into stuff, and that's okay. It's good to get into things and get excited about various things. And we do that with various, some of us it's sports, right? Some of us it's a hobby. Sometimes it's Netflix, right? It's pretty hard to not watch the next episode of whatever. Sometimes it's a video game, whatever it is. We, we have this capacity, or sometimes it's a thing at work, right? A, that's something that we're moving towards. That's, that's good. But God made you with this capacity to become obsessed because he meant himself to be that one magnificent obsession of our lives. And part of, of being all in is saying, God, I'd just like my life to be all about pursuing you more. And again, that's not always true of us every single day or every single moment of every day, but we say, let that be increasingly true of me. Again, when you look at these four things, none of us could say we do all these things perfectly, but we could say, God, make that increasingly true of me. Make that increasingly true of me. And that's my prayer, that God would make those things increasingly true of us as individuals and increasingly true of our church as a whole. I was reflecting on this, and I was just thinking, man, I only have one life to live. You only have one life to live, one shot at this deal. The way one preacher said it, you have one brief stay on this ball of dirt we call planet planet Earth, right? You get one shot. And the question is, what will we do with the one and only life God has given us? And that's a question for our church too. We get one shot as a church at, at this point in history. 
And the question is, what will we be? Will we just kind of go, yeah, well, that season was kind of a mediocre season. Or will we be the hell-battering, earth-shaking, life-changing place that God meant his church to be? I think part of the reason the church in the book of Acts was so world-changing was because they got this value. They got it. And when people ask me as a pastor, what makes your church uh, so exciting to be a part of? Why did we baptize over 100 people in the last couple years? Uh, why is God moving there? Lives getting changed there? Miracles taking place there? I have several answers, but one of those answers is the people, the people of the church actually believe this stuff. They're actually in. They, they, they pray and live and sacrifice and obey like it's actually real. There's a kind of sincerity around this place that I think God responds to and I think the world is longing for. D.L. Moody said, give me 10 men wholly committed to God and I will change the world. Change the world. This is a story back in the 1800s of a, a preacher who was an open-air preacher. Had big crowds coming to see him. But in town there was a famous atheist. And this famous atheist would go every week to hear the preacher preach. One time somebody came to him and said, man, everybody knows you don't believe this stuff. Why do you come hear him preach every week? And the atheist looked back at the guy and he says, no, you're right, I don't believe it. But that guy sure believes it. And that's why I come. When we're sincere in our faith, it impacts the people around us. And so what I'm convinced is that full and radical devotion to Christ is not for a few radical people who lack brains or lack something worthwhile to live for. It's for those who are honest enough and courageous enough to really follow Jesus. One time Jesus was on one of these rants about commitment. And Peter, Peter's a bit of a loud mouth, and he just babbles back, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. And, and I, whenever I read that, I, I, I'm ready for Jesus to kind of rebuke Peter. You know, ready for Jesus to kind of still him and just, you know, because Peter often said things that weren't, weren't right in the moment, you know. But it's interesting how Jesus responds to Peter saying, we've left everything to follow you. Jesus looks back at Peter and says, Peter, you're right. And I want you to know something. Anyone, anyone who's left this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, he makes this big list, will receive a hundredfold return in this life and in the life to come. He goes, Peter, you need to know this. It's worth it. Be glad you did. So that's the end of my sermon, but <laughs> I was praying, and I felt convicted to share one more thing with you. And since it's a sermon on commitment, I thought, yeah, I could keep them a little longer, right? Should be able to get away with that. So here's the deal. I, I felt prompted to share one more aspect of this with you, because for me, though being committed to Jesus, being all in, was one of the best decisions I ever made. I made it in 1990 in the summer changed my life. I experienced a lot of joy out of it and a lot of sacrifice out of it. But one of the things I discovered as the months and then years wore on in following Jesus is that getting a fire lit in my heart was actually easier than keeping that fire burning. I found that my own heart, even though I wanted to serve Christ wholeheartedly, was prone to wander, that it was always looking for an easier way, a place to compromise. And I had this kind of idea in my head that I would go hard after God for a year, maybe two years or five years, but at some point it would get easy and then it would kind of maintain itself. The fire would just keep itself going. And here's what I learned. I learned that the longer I'm a Christian, the more intentionally I need to stoke my own spiritual fires, keep them alive. In Deuteronomy, Moses said it this way. He said, uh, don't let these things fade from your heart. Don't let them fade from your heart. And I actually wrote this down a number of years ago. I'll just read it to you. I said, no matter how committed I am one day, if I don't add fuel to the fire of my commitment, it will die down. I have to take personal responsibility for my own level of spiritual intensity and to intentionally guard it and grow it because the reality is there's a slow, incessant pull of gravity toward mediocrity. What is hot without more heating will inevitably become lukewarm. But God's vision for me in my faith is that I would be continuously falling more in love with Jesus every day, heating up more and more till my final day. And my theme verse for that area of my life is Romans 12, 11, that I should never be lacking in zeal, but keep my spiritual fervor serving the Lord. In other words, it's my personal responsibility to keep that all in spirit in my own heart and in my own life. And uh, I found that a battle. And actually, uh, about 15 years ago, I made myself a little list. It was a list that I actually used in one of the ministries of our church to try to help our church uh, give their best in that area of ministry. And I, I put that little list on a business card. This is over 15 years old now, and it's still in my wallet today. I still 
Hang on to that. And uh, a few years ago in our church here, I preached a whole series called All In. It was an eight-part series. And part of that series was to share these five things with you, and we actually give you a handout for that. And the prompting I had while I was preparing this message was to give you that handout again. And our ushers are actually just going to, you guys can hand that out right now. And this is what the handout has on it. It just has these five areas. And the reason I want to give them to you before you leave today is I just want to offer you some fuel. This has been fuel for me to help me keep my heart aflame. Fair enough? And so these are the things that, that I've come back to again and again to help me remember. Giving my all for God is not crazy. It's the most sane and reasonable thing I can do. So here are the reasons why I think that's true. Uh, firstly, my God deserves it. Anything less than my all misrepresents the God I serve. He's a great God, and he deserves a great commitment from me. In fact, anything less than my all is blasphemy against his name, against who he is. Uh, the second reason is that our enemy detests it. Anything less than my all misrepresents the situation we're in. I'm in an all-out battle. You're in an all-out battle. You don't wander onto the battlefield, you know, just going, meh, we'll see what happens. You get shot up that way. Being in an all-out battle means that we ought to give our all. The third one is our reward defends it. Anything less than my all misses out on what God has to offer. And I just remind myself, there's rewards for living full on for Jesus. Our mission demands it is the fourth one. Anything less than my all misuses what God has given me. The, the mission we have is the highest stakes mission in the world. It certainly deserves commitment from us. And then the last one, which is the most motivating for me, our Savior died for it. Anything less than my all misunderstands the price, the price that has been paid. See, God has never given anything less than his very best for you and me. And actually, uh, through my whole high school, I had a little phrase that kind of kept me going, and it was just this, Jesus, you died for me, I'll live for you. You died for me, I'll live for you. Now, again, we're not going to do all of this perfectly. We're going to get all of this 100%. But here's the deal. I'm hoping that you can take a list like this, maybe put it in your Bible or put it by your bed or put it up on a wall somewhere you'll see it, and just use that to help you come back to a, a more fervent faith, to help you stoke your own spiritual fire, to help you live more fully for Christ. 